The year is 2013, a very special year for music, marking the unexpected return of many legendary electronic musicians, Daft Punk, Aphex Twin, and eventually, Boards of Canada. After eight years of complete silence since their last full-length project, The Campfire Head Phase, the duo put out a mysterious video on their YouTube channel, filled with hearing visuals along with the mysterious song, and it became official. The new Boards of Canada record was on the way. And this return for the duo was not only surprising, but also represented a significant change for the music itself. Tomorrow's Harvest still remains faithful to the duo's last albums being filled with hidden codes and secret messages. But it's also without a doubt the duo's most cinematic project, with its 17 songs acting as a soundtrack to a hopeless, dystopian world. Treating with themes of nature, division, and the apocalypse, this record becomes more of a statement on the fate of our planet and our self-destructing nature as a species. This record also comes out at a particular time, when climate change becomes one of the most important global issues. In some way, Tomorrow's Harvest proposes a very pessimistic view to this issue. What if we don't make it? It then becomes the soundtrack to the end of humanity. And in this video, we'll take a deep dive in this album, track by track as always. But before we get to that, I'd like to welcome you to my brand new improved studio. You may have noticed I have moved to this spacious basement where I will do my videos from now on. I know it feels a bit empty right now and the sound must be horrible, but I have my YouTuber triangles now, so that cements me as an official YouTuber of the YouTube.com platform. Um, so yeah, feel free to tell me in the comments what you think should be behind me. Perhaps we bring back the Cheez-Its or I could put like a, a bar. Very quickly, I'd like to shout out the website Bach Pages once again. Bach Pages is a sort of Wikipedia for Boards of Canada where fans can pitch theories and their findings about the music. It's pretty great. And many of the findings I'll talk about in this video come from Bach Pages, so feel free to check them out. This is not sponsored. I'm just very happy that this website exists, so I don't have to search on Google for a million hours and that also if you can feel free to subscribe to the channel because uh, these videos take a lot of time to make especially with editing and also everything gets copyrighted so if you can like this video and subscribe to the channel thank you it really means a lot that was my ted talk now on with the video so tomorrow's harvest Unlike other Boards of Canada albums, it's actually pretty obvious to what this title means. Basically, it's the harvest of future generations, and that can be interpreted in two different ways. The seeds we plant right now will be what the future generations get, in both the literal and figurative meaning. And if we talk about the cover, while most of the previous Boards of Canada album covers show very trippy and blurry visuals, this cover stands out with its clean and simplistic design. It's basically a picture of a city seen from a faraway desert, with the sun over the horizon. And if you have a good eye, you'll notice that this city is none other than San Francisco. You'll notice that Pyramid thing building, which I don't know the name of because I am Canadian. The photo is taken from a nearby highway, but unlike other pictures taken from this same location, in comparison, the cover appears almost ghost-like. A ghost city surrounded by nothing but a desolate wasteland. And it's such a strange coincidence, but I think the first track of this album represents this feeling perfectly.
The intro to Tomorrow's Harvest is a track called Gemini, and although it only lasts 2 minutes and 50 seconds, it's relatively long compared to other tracks from BOC being all generally under one minute. The track starts with the sound of a trumpet, followed by delicate synths, which give a pretty hopeful feeling to start with. But don't let that distract you because it basically means the end. According to the Bible, more precisely the book of Revelation, the apocalypse would be heralded by the sound of trumpets. In total, seven trumpets are sounded, each cueing a different apocalyptic event, which are actually represented by the seven notes heard following the sound of the trumpet on the track. And then we're hit with this menacing drone, along with samples of radio transmission, basically introducing the listener to this dystopian world. But what about the title? Gemini. Well, this title might have a lot more significance than you might think. The first thing that'll come to mind is obviously the zodiac sign Gemini, which um, I completely forgot was a meme until I typed Gemini on Google. But aside from that, this is the period between May 21 and June 20. And uh, guess when this album came out? That's right, June 10, 2013, you're pretty, you're pretty good. But the most interesting thing about this song is that it's heavily correlated to a poem called Astronomica, a poem written by Marcus Manilius that is almost 2,000 years old. In this excerpt, the poet talks about the Gemini twins, Castor and Pollux stars in the Gemini constellation. From the twins come less laborious callings and a more agreeable way of life, provided by varied song and voices of harmonious stone, slender pipes, the melodies inborn in strings, and the words fitted thoretto. Those so endowed find even work a pleasure. They would banish the arms of war, the trumpet's call, and the gloom of old age. Theirs is a life of ease and unfading youth spent in the arms of love. They also discover paths to the skies, complete with a survey of the heavens with numbers and measurements, and outstrip the flight of the stars. Nature yields to their genius, which it serves in all things. So many are the accomplishments of which the twins are fruitful. I hope there were not too much mispronunciations, I'm really trying hard. <laughs> it would be also worth to mention that this poem is an exameter didactic poem. Get it? Exameter, hexagon. Only real Boards of Canada fans will get this. But the most interesting thing about this poem are the twin stars, Castor and Pollux, which will be important going forward in this video. But for the flow of this video, I think I'll get back to this in a bit and just move on to the next track. Reach for the Dead is the second track on Tomorrow's Harvest, and it was the first and only single released to promote the album. And this is definitely one of the tracks that make me think of like older BOC songs, while keeping that fresh cinematic feel to it. But there's still this kind of uncomfortable atmosphere from Gemini, with these kind of weird choirs in the background. And for the title of the track, Reach for the Dead could be interpreted not as in reaching for dead people, but as in reaching for something that is unreachable, basically. An impossible goal. The track was also accompanied with an official music video, which is 
pretty damn rare for BOC. The video is mostly showing buildings in desert landscapes probably destroyed by bombs or disasters. But at the end of the video, something interesting happens. The sun splits in three, which, um, which I'll sell agree, but that looks fucking cool. So first I thought this was a reference to the Gemini twins, because at first the sun appears to be splitting in two. Uh, but then I became sad because a third sun appeared and uh, I couldn't get this theory to work for myself. But something does make an incredible amount of sense, and that's Trinity. Trinity meaning a group of three people or three things. And you know what else is named Trinity? The first nuclear bomb ever detonated. The bomb was a test that took place in a desert. So um, there might be a reason for these broken buildings in the desert after all. The third track, White Cyclosa, is one of the simpler tracks of the record, being mostly an RPG-ated loop, repeating over and over while a helicopter sample plays in the background. The track is also oddly similar to the song in the opening scene of the movie Day of the Dead, But as for the meaning of the title, there's still some mystery around it. First, Cyclosa could be referring to a genus of spiders which create webs incorporating the remains of their prey for camouflage. That's not much of a link there, but... Secondly, its meaning could be alluding to the Greek word Cyclosa, meaning moving in a circle. And I'm afraid I can't provide any further explanation on this because that would ruin a bit of the twists of this video. So um, instead, let's just go on to the next track. Jackward Causeway is the longest track from Tomorrow's Harvest, and my personal favorite. And that's because the instrumental is constructed in a very unique way. The song starts with this synth loop, but if you listen closely, you'll notice that this loop isn't actually a loop, because every time it restarts, it's a little bit different. Like if new patterns were created as the song plays, I'm sorry, I just love my triangle so much. And therefore, the title could very likely be related to the Jackward Loom, the first machine that simplified the making of textiles with complex patterns. So think about it. The instrumental is like a carpet with complex patterns slowly being sawn. But the title could also be related to Albert Jackward, a geneticist well-known for defending the concept of degrowth, basically a social movement that is against economic growth. Degrowth values the need to reduce global consumption and production to maximize happiness while being an ecology, a solution to our current global crisis. But now should we completely get rid of the economy to save the earth? Uh, I don't think that's a good idea, but uh, hell, what do I know? I'm only an 18-year-old white guy that makes videos about music in my mom's basement, so I probably aren't the best person to answer that question. So uh, yeah, I'll just leave it to Albert Jaguar, but for now, I think we can go on to the next track.
Telepath is the fifth track on the album and is a short interlude filled with mysterious samples. The title is actually related to telepathy, and it shows pretty clearly when you hear the vocals throughout the track. And that is because of the Cold War? Let me explain. In the early 20th century, telepathy was one of the main subjects of research for scientists, and many of those experiments were made in relation to the microwave auditory effect a phenomenon used to transmit sounds from a microwave emitter into the human brain. And there has been many reports from test subjects and scientists that the sounds heard resembled heavily those emitted by an artificial voice box. And guess what? That's how the voices on Telepath sound like. The sixth track is Cold Earth, and it's one of the simpler tracks of the record, in, in my opinion. And I say that because there's not really much to it that isn't already obvious. Like, the title is pretty self-explanatory in the context of this album, but it could also be a reference to a book, Cold Earth, by Sarah Moss a book in which archaeologists visit a dig site in Greenland where they will become isolated after a plague pandemic ravages the planet. And by the way, yes, it's worse than COVID. But there's also this part from an interview with the duo talking in particular about the track called Earth. We're definitely vintage hardware freaks. We've always used older gear. Everything we use is decrepit. Our studio is full of wooden things covered with LEDs. We'll go great lengths to get a hold of a specific instrument just to get a particular sound. For example, there's a sound in Cold Earth that is something like only one second of audio. It comes from an obscure old effect unit that cost us a lot of time and road miles to source and it ended up being one second of audio on the record. And when I looked for what could be that sound on the internet, uh, I found nothing, absolutely nothing. No one mentioned it anywhere. So I was determined, me, Big Tom Tom, will find that mysterious one second of audio and share it to the world so I could win $10,000 from this new Mr. Beast challenge. And uh, I think I found it at 3.07. They said it came from an obscure old unit effect and it only lasts one second and it's the only place in the track that this sound occurs. So um, it, it, tell me what you think about this in the comments, I guess. Transmissionis for Rocks is track 7 on Tamar's Harvest, and it has a weird title, first of all, because it's actually written in two different languages. Transmissionis is a Spanish word, meaning, obviously, transmissions. But the word for rocks is a bit more uncertain, because guess what? It's Latin. It's it's a dead language, but it would mean either fierce or aggressive. So together makes fierce transmissions or aggressive transmissions. And uh, I think this would be a great time to talk about this whole transmissions 
thing in the record because most, if not all of the samples on this records are transmissions, radio transmissions. And this is something that is shown not only in the tracks, but also in the artwork for the album with images of radio towers. Even the announcement of this album was made like a transmission. And obviously this is a way to illustrate the context or the narrative of the album. If disasters are striking the earth, radio transmissions would be a way to communicate between each other. Basically the last flicker of hope that you're not left alone in this world. But to get back to the song, I was gonna say the title is pretty fitting because there are a lot of transmissions in the song. In the track, you can hear a female vocal saying over and over 1999. But as the sample repeats itself, it feels like she says the word dying over and over. <laughs> And, and uh, that's pretty much it for this song. Sick Times is track eight on the album and is a song that we don't have a lot of information on, but uh, there's still a lot of samples in this song. It's also interesting that a sample from an older BOC track, Rue the World, is found on this song. I've read that the title could be a reference to Pestilence, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Pestilence represents death and is also associated with plagues and illnesses, tying it with the title Sick Times. I'm not sure about that link though, um, so I'll just be throwing it out there and moving on to the next track, which is far more mysterious. Okay, stop, stop. I, I can't go on with this deep dive without setting something straight because the track list I've been presenting you um, doesn't make sense. In fact, the whole track list of Tomorrow's Harvest doesn't make sense. If you're familiar with Boards of Canada, you know that these guys are masters of transitions. In their other projects, the tracks flow so well between each other, it's, it's almost orgasmic. <laughs> but on this record, not so much. In fact, not at all. What is this? This, this? this doesn't fit. So why am I telling you this now? Well, that's because the track list is not in the right order. And I've waited halfway through this track list because the track collapse is theoretically the end of the record. Let me explain. 
In an interview with The Guardian, Michael Sanderson stated that there is a palindromic structure centered around the track collapse in the middle. If you don't know what a palindrome is, it's basically a word that you can read both ways. For example, radar or the famous Honda Civic. And that's actually how the track collapse is built. It's a palindrome. The track is identical when played forward or backwards. So you might think, oh, this album has 17 songs, track 9 is a palindrome, there's 8 songs on each side, so the album is a palindrome? Well, no. <laughs> It's a bit more complicated, actually. Remember when I said that this album had a lot of themes of separation and in the intro track Gemini, when I talked about the Gemini twins? What if every track had a twin brother, but they were just separated in a palindromic structure? In the same interview with The Guardian, Michael Sanderson said that track 16, Come to Dust, is, I quote, a musical reprise of Reach for the Dead, the second track. Why don't we stitch those two tracks together? Just to... why not? It, it, it's perfect. It's like if it was an extension of the song. So what if we did this for every other track, pairing each one with its sister track leaving Collapse Untouched as the final track, which is already paired with its sister track because it's a palindrome. We have ourselves a whole new track list. And now, I know some of you might disagree with this theory, the Boards of Canada fanbase is a big community. And I could have continued down the normal track list because there's so many ways you can speculate on this album. Like, come on, it's Boards of Canada. And not only just a normal track list, I know there are different takes on alternate track lists. But when I saw this theory, I just knew I had to make a video around it because it's... It, it just clicked for me. When I do research on all these albums for deep dives, there's always this moment of just pure enlightenment when it seems like you just understood the laws of the universe. So instead of going further down the classic track list, let's start over from the top, only this time I'll address each track from the second half of the record as an extension of the tracks from the first half. This new track list starts with Gemini, followed by Semena Murthik, a Russian phrase meaning the seeds of the dead. And I say extension because just look at how those two tracks merge into each other. For example, let's compare the transition between Gemini and Reach for the Dead and Gemini and Semena Murdvik. Although you can make the argument that both these transitions sound relatively good, you can't deny that Gemini and Semena Murdvik also both share the same feelings and kind of intensity. Following the bringing of the apocalypse with the trumpets on Gemini, we're hit with this cold and desperate track, like if you were standing in a lifeless field surrounded by ruins, destroyed by disasters. I thought this comment on Bach Pages summed it up perfectly. Everyone is dead. That's what this song sums up for me. Cheers, BOC. Another interesting fact about the song is that the title, Semana Murdvik, is an anagram 
for Ken Me My Harvest, which if you speak Irish or have seen the TV show Outlander, means understand me my harvest. So either genius planning or weird coincidence. Next, we would have the track Reach for the Dead, followed by Come to Dust, which definitely shares the same themes as Reach for the Dead. Take for example this excerpt from a funeral song in William Shakespeare's Cymbeline. Fear no more the lightning flash, nor the all-dreaded thunderstone. Fear not slander, censor rash. Thou hast finished joy and moan, all lovers young. All lovers must consign to thee and come to dust. So unlike the initial track list, which is kind of confusing when trying to construct a narrative, with this new track list, we're already seeing things more clearly. Gemini and Semena Mertvik represent the literal apocalypse, while Reach for the Dead and Come to Dust represents the aftermath. With the funeral song from Shakespeare in mind, this could be a period of grief and sorrow where survivors could be mourning to the ones they lost. But Also Come To Dust is a way more hopeful track than the others, meaning the apocalypse may have passed and that it's time to rebuild. New Seeds is among one of my favorite tracks, and that's mostly because of this opening guitar melody. There's just something about it that's so unconventional, it's so cool. And it may sound that way because that guitar closely resembles the sound you hear when you lose phone signal. So New Seeds is definitely one of the most hopeful cuts on the album, and it's fitting pretty well within the theme when you look at the two previous songs, White Cyclosa and Come to Dust. Remember that helicopter sample in White Cyclosa? At the beginning of this video, I said that this was more representative of a disastrous situation with the context of the apocalypse in mind. But if now is the aftermath, of an apocalypse, I'd think way more of this helicopter as a rescue helicopter rather than people escaping in an helicopter. So obviously, if we're trying to construct a narrative, New Seeds is a fresh start into a brighter future. Still continuing down this new track list, we get the track Jaguar Causeway, followed by Sundown, a short and rather simple interlude. That when played straight after Jaguar Causeway, seems like a continuation of the outro of the track, only pitched down. The title Sundown could actually be connected to the artwork of the album. When you look at the front cover, the sun looks like it's rising, and on the back cover, it looks like it's setting, or, or maybe just on the front it's setting and on the back it's rising. I don't... can, can a sun scientist help us? Comments, please. But anyway, this could be a way of representing the two different sides of the album, separated by collapse. The first side represents sunrise, then we have collapse at noon, and the second side is sundown. There's also some speculation that sundown was a track left off Geogati as a sort of continuation of the penultimate track from that album, Corsair. And I think it certainly resembles Corsair, but I doubt it's really related to it. It could maybe just be a demo of the track, or a B-side, or I don't know. 
a previous version of the track. Next up is Telepath, followed by Nothing Is Real, and finally, we get more transmission samples. But this next radio sample is probably the most important one in the entire album. This sample, I think, sums up the entire album perfectly because it just it just says so much. If our species go extinct, it will most likely be because of our greed. Taking climate change, for example, because I don't know, it's a it seems like a pretty reasonable example. Why are we still fighting and arguing about this issue when it has been proven countless times by science that if we don't gravitate towards greener energy, we're gonna be in big trouble. Well, money. Most of the people that have the power to make a significant change would rather keep that power to themselves because like, what is it gonna do if we keep extracting oil? We've been doing it for centuries and we've been fine. Us humans have been comfortable for so goddamn long that we think it's impossible that we can just disappear. We've always found a solution, but the reality is eternal life is impossible and we're closer to extinction than we've ever been before. So in this sample, humanity is basically talking to Jesus or God. And the funny thing that I'm just noticing now as I'm recording this video is uh, that in this sample, humanity is blaming this greed on God. Like if it was Jesus' fault or God's fault that you have greed. It's like humans fucked up and they just blame it on anyone but themselves. All right, now I, I analyzed enough. Let's get, let's get back to the track. I think it's also interesting that the voices on Nothing Is Real resemble heavily the voices on Telepath. Remember when I talked about the microwave auditory effect? Well, the same effects seem to be added to the voices on Nothing Is Real. So yeah, it's still pretty interesting how well these songs fit together. It seems we enter a darker part of the tracklist when we get to Cold Earth, followed by a Ritual. This is the kind of track that I just love. It gives such an unsettling feeling while still being a very simple and short interlude. And for that reason, it's unfortunately one of the songs we know the least about in the record. Some think you Ritual is a reprise of Jack Ward Causeway because it contains similar instruments. And although this doesn't make sense in this current theory I'm talking about, this is just to show how many ways you could speculate on that palindrome theory. Really, with Boards of Canada, there is absolutely no way to be sure of anything, which is why it's so fun to debunk these albums. In fact, even this palindrome theory I chose to center this video around has some inconsistencies, like the fact that Cold Earth and You Ritual don't have a concrete link figuratively or instrumentally speaking. Anything is possible with BOC. So again, I'd love to hear what your ideas are. So don't hesitate to comment down below. The next combination is made of Transmissionis for Rocks, followed by Split Your Infinities. And it's actually surprising 
how well those two tracks transition into each other. The title Split Through Infinities could also be a reference to how the album is made, how it's splitted into two different sides. But anyway, between the two songs, the voice samples from Transmissionis for Rocks continue on Split Your Infinities. The FEMA plans to imprison American citizens have generated a lot of interest around the country in locating the potential prison camps throughout the country. I didn't play this last sample in its entirety because it's very long, but I'll just show it here right now. It basically talks about the conspiracy theories around the Federal Emergency Management Agency in America, or FEMA. There are beliefs that FEMA imprisoned many US citizens in concentration camps like war veterans and other people to exterminate them and establish a new world order. You know, like Illum Illuminati and shit. <laughs> I'll leave some links down in the description if you want to read more about it, but it's, it's just conspiracy theories. Like, once you have read one, you've read them all. So regardless of whether those conspiracies are true or not, I think this just shows how everything is turning into chaos again. And um, no, it doesn't get better from here. The last combination of tracks on this new tracklist is made of Sick Times followed by Palace Posey. And it's pretty well known in the BOC community that Palace Posey is an anagram for Apocalypse which ties the song even more to Sick Times, which, if you remember, was apparently a reference to one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Pestilence. In terms of samples, the ones heard throughout the track remain pretty unclear. <laughs> Basically, we don't understand anything. But the real meaning of this song certainly lies within the title itself, especially the word posy. A posy is a flower, or a word used to describe a bouquet of flowers. And these flowers have been known to be used for protection and to ward off the smell of the disease during the Great Plague. Sick times, posies, that's a nice link right there. So weirdly enough, with that new track list, the horseman theory makes 100% more sense. But if we take a look back at the narrative of this new track list, we started off with the apocalypse and then recovered from it. Then everything went to shit again, and now everything collapses. Like I said before, Collapse is the ending of Tamara's Harvest in this palindrome theory, with the track itself being a palindrome. And the abrupt ending of the track makes the ending of the record even more dramatic, because Palace Posey does not immediately follow like in the initial tracklist. And that ending too is pretty mysterious. In the ending seconds of Collapse, it almost feels like you could hear distant explosions with these strong bursts of wind. It 
It would be also interesting to add that the final track of Side B on Tamar's Harvest Vinyl is Collapse. So what to make of all this? I mean, compared to albums like Geogadi, it's way less clear what happens in this album in general. But to answer this question, for starters, I think Tamar's Harvest is a statement on our future as a species. No, no matter what way you listen to the album, either it's with the normal way or this alternate trackless thing, one thing is clear. I think this album does a great job at pointing out our self-destructing nature as a species. If you take the original Trekless, for example, even though the argument could be made that the themes vary a lot from song to song and that it can become confusing at times, I think the last track, Semena Mervik, brings the listener to the exact same ending as with the alternate track list. And I think that can be summed up with this excerpt from, again, the same interview with The Guardian, where Mike Sanderson said this about Semena Mervik. At the end of the whole album, you've reached some sort of sanctuary, and then the whole thing is stolen away from you again with the final track. That last track has a deliberate feeling of complete futility that I find kind of funny. That's where the obsessive scientific work comes in, and yeah, it takes us ages. So, from the duo's point of view, we're fucked. <laughs> no matter what seeds we plant, or what tomorrow's harvest will be like, sooner or later, the demise of humanity will be itself. And even with this theoretical track list, the narrative seems to follow the aftermath of a disaster, and in some way how survivors try to rebuild society with this series of hopeful tracks. We still can't avoid the apocalypse and to see everything we've built collapse, and this cycle starts over and over again, like we can't learn from our mistakes because we're human. That, folks, was my take on this chilling but wonderful album. I know I went for a pretty pessimistic view for this deep dive, but I still think it was appropriate given the nature of the record. Before I end this video, I'd like to talk a bit about my plans for 2022. You may have noticed I haven't uploaded in a while, and that's because I have taken a little break for Christmas, and then school started again, and I remembered admissions also started, so I had to apply to video game schools, because that's where I want to go. I don't know why I'm talking about this, uh, but uh, basically I had to work to make a video game for my admissions anyway. What I'm trying to say is that for the next months I have less time to allow to the YouTube channel, but I still have a lot of videos in the works for this year, and I'm pretty excited about every one of them. I feel like I'm in a spot where I can allow myself to try out a lot of different things on the channel, and that's what I'm planning on doing this year. I've only started making these kind of videos last fall and the support has been unreal. I'm so grateful to have an audience like you guys to watch my dumbass videos reaching way too hard for meaning in music. And I appreciate it so much. <laughs> so if you're watching this, whoever you are, thank you. Anyway, don't forget to like and subscribe because you don't want to miss on all this new epic content that's about to come out soon-ish. So take care and I'll see you in the next one.